Do you understand the size of yourself? Most people don't. They either think they're too big or too small, myself included. The world is a reflection in your pond, and your word is your bond. Your tongue is your wand. How could your chest hold a sky, but it does? How could your chest hold a sky, but it does? If you're looking for reason, then there it is. If you're looking for beauty, first be it. If you are it, you will see it. You are the son of skies, the daughter of skies in disguise. Do you even understand the size of yourself? Most people don't. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want you to know about the piece you just heard, uh, that opening piece, The Size of Yourself. The video sco and score is written by Ismail Bilal, and it's written and performed by Askia Bilal. Please stay tuned at the conclusion of our program to hear another piece by them called You Were Chosen. Now, I want to take a moment of silence and ask you to join me to honor Black life. And I ask that you join me at that time in seeking protection, celebration, illumination, and elevation of Black hearts, minds, and communities worldwide. Please join me. Thank you, everyone. Happy Earth Day. My name is Ivan Henderson. And I want to pause for a moment for an important message from our sponsor this evening, Bank of America. Good evening. I'm Debbie O'Brien, Market Executive with Bank of America in Philadelphia. As a longtime partner of the African American Museum, it is our honor to support this evening's book club discussion with Dr. Swan about his book, Paul Lu's Diaspora. The events of the past year have created a sense of true urgency that has arisen across our nation, particularly in view of the racial injustices we have seen and the disproportionate impact the current health and humanitarian crisis is having on communities of color. We feel that urgency and are taking action. Tonight's vital discussion will give us all an opportunity to learn from Dr. Swan's firsthand experiences with Black internationalism and environmental justice. At Bank of America, we recognize that the private sector can play a pivotal role in helping our communities, and we are committed to doing more to advance racial equality, address environmental justice, and find solutions to some of the biggest challenges we face as a society today. This past year, Bank of America has made two key commitments to address economic and racial equality and accelerate the transition to a low carbon and sustainable economy. Our 1.25 billion five-year commitment is helping local communities, such as here in Philadelphia, address economic and racial inequality accelerated by the global pandemic. 
and this is just a start. Recently, we pledged to mobilize $1 trillion in capital by 2030 to help our clients transition to more sustainable business activities, ultimately helping to accelerate the transition to a low-carbon, sustainable economy. We know how important these issues are, and we hope that you enjoy what promises to be an enlightening conversation this evening with Dr. Swan. Thank you. So I wanna um, extend a, a, another warm thank you uh, to our partner, first of all, Criterion Connection, LLC, and of course, to our sponsor, Bank of America, for working with us at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, or AMP, um, as we call it, to produce tonight's event. And my name is Ivan Henderson. I'm the Vice President of Programming at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Now, during this past year, we began offering virtual programs, events like tonight, and we'll continue with this moving forward, even after we reopen the museum's doors. So please check our website for all the information and program updates. So on behalf of our board, our staff, our volunteers, uh, members and other supporters, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for this important Earth Day event. A presentation by Dr. Keto Swan on his award-winning book, Paulus Diaspora, Black Internationalism and Environment Environmental Justice, followed by a conversation with Vashti Dubois of the Colored Girls Museum, and hopefully a few questions from you, our virtual audience. I wanna take a moment to thank and honor AMP's Volunteer Docent Corps for their continued support of our institution. This virtual book club, along with several other changes I've seen over the past several years, was established and has grown due to your energy, your creativity, and your consistency. Your dedication to teaching, learning, and community building is inspirational. And I look forward to planning our next round of book events with you or whatever else you have up your sleeves. Now, I want to take my time on this because you see this is also National Volunteer Week. Although these flowers are only virtual, I send them to you all from my heart. Um, and thank you for creating the framework for a day like today. Now, I'm always excited to discover our heroes, the people whose names we are not maybe are not known by most, but whose works undergird much of our knowledge, experience, and wisdom. It's an honor to have my friend, Dr. Keto Swan here to awaken some of us to, and perhaps help deepen others' knowledge and curiosity about Black agency and leadership and international environmental justice efforts. And we are honored to have Vashti Dubois join us to articulate some of the thoughts and questions that arise from both her reading of the selected chapter and Dr. Swan's presentation. Now, without further ado, I'll formally introduce our guests and get out of your way. First, Vashti Dubois is the founder and executive director of the Colored Girls Museum. Prior to creating the museum, Vashti held leadership positions at a number of organizations over the span of her 30-year career in nonprofit and arts administration. Dubois' work focused primarily on the issues impacting girls and women of color at organizations such as the Free Library of Philadelphia, Treehouse Books, the Historic Church of the Advocate, Children's Art Carnival in New York City, the Haymarket People's Fund in Boston, Congreso Girls Center, and the Leeway Foundation. In 2015, Dubois opened the Colored Girls Museum to, quote, honor the stories and experiences and history of colored girls throughout the African diaspora. It's the first memoir museum of its kind, offering visitors a multidisciplinary experience in a residential space. The Color Girls Museum has been engineered to pop up in other cities and neighborhoods around the country, transforming ordinary spaces into Color Girls Museum outposts that collect, archive, and share the stories of indigenous colored girls. Dubois is a graduate of Wesleyan University. She was a NM NAMAC fellow she received a Clark Fellowship to the Clark Art School for the spring of 2022, um, and also has a memoir in the works. We are truly honored to have you here this evening um, and blessed by your presence. And of course, Dr. Keto Swan is a professor of Africana Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he directs the William Monroe Trotter Institute for the Study of Black Culture. An historian of the 20th century African diaspora, Swan is the author of Paolo's Diaspora, Black Internationalism and Environmental Justice, Black Power in Bermuda, and the forthcoming Pacifica Black, Black Internationalism in Oceania. He has garnered national awards and grants for his research, including fellowships from the NEH, the American Council of Learned Societies, 
Harvard University's Radcliffe Institute, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, the Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the list goes on and on. His research, teaching, and community work has taken him across the United States, Britain, Australia, Kenya, Venezuela, and we may as well just say the world. Swan co-edits the Black Internationalism book series at the University Press of Illinois. Now about the book, noted as a 2021 NEH Fellowships Open Book Program Award, a finalist for the 2021 ASALH Book Prize and one of the AAIHS Best Black History Books of 2020, Paolo's Diaspora is a sweeping story of Black internationalism and the life and work of 20th century inter environmental activist Paolo Camara Cafego, challenging US centered views of Black power. Keto Swan offers a radically broader perspective, showing how Kamara Cafego helped connect liberation efforts of the African diaspora throughout the global South. In a riveting narrative that runs through Caribbean sugarcane fields, Liberian rubber plantations, and Papua New Guinean rainforests, Papua Paola's diaspora recognizes a global leader who has largely been absent from scholarship. In doing so, it brings to light little known relationships among Black power, Pan Africanism, and environmental justice. With that, I give you my friend, Dr. Keto Swan. Thank you for joining us. Ivan, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks to you, your support team at the museum, Fukan Kaldun, all the sponsors for making this tremendously important event happen tonight. I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here. Uh, this, this project means a lot to myself, uh, to the island of Bermuda. Paolo Cameron Cafego is a national hero. And I'm really looking forward to engaging with the audience in terms of questions and, and comments. <clears throat> so I like to jump right in. Uh, you know, while the book spends Paolo's time in Bermuda, uh, Cuba, United States, Liberia, Tanzania, Kenya, Australia, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea. Tonight I'm going to focus on one uh, relatively small but major part of his life around the organization of the Six Pan African Congress that takes place in Tanzania in 1974 and is the subject of the eighth chapter. Uh, of the book. I'd just like to begin by the, with the intro of that chapter. Black freedom struggles have held intriguing relationships with the ideas of technology. On the one hand, Black movements have historically viewed science as being an avatar of oppression linked to enslavement, surveillance, and environmental justice. Yet, they have also perceived technology to be a lever of liberation essential to racial uplift and self-determination. Black power's legitimate anxiety surrounding technology was perhaps best benchmarked through the era's Black poetry, music, and literature. For example, Gil Scott Heron chided Whitey's presence on the moon in the midst of his sister's impo impoverishment. And Marvin Gaye denounced the ecological devastation of the Earth's blue skies. For Bob Marley and the I-3s, Babylon spaceships were sailing a million miles away from the troubled world's reality of concrete jungles. The Black Scholar's 1974 special issue, Black Science, lamented racism and exclusion of African-Americans from the world of science and technology, which it claimed had generated an attitude of anti-science among Black people. Activists in Oceania, meanwhile, decried nuclear testing in the region as an offshoot of colonialism. Still, this chapter shows that Black political movements did not totally disavow science. Decades before the release of Marvel's Black Panther, Black activists, scholars, and artists also saw technology as a crucial ally in their movements. The Black Panther Party's 10-point program called for community control of modern technology. The Melanesian island of Bougainville used green technology to win an environmental revolution against the multinational corporate exploitation of its copper resources. And with radical imagination, Black power activists thus engaged technology to globally forge diaspora. These women and men sought to create a new world in an unpredictable era of social upheaval, political misadventure, 
and capricious nights and days, much like the protagonists in the iconic video game Minecraft, which is actually the title of this chapter, Minecraft in a Black World. Their inventory was full of tools innovatively forged from the deep bedrock of global Black freedom struggles. Indeed, Black power activists lived, dreamed, and loved in survival mode. Their antagonists were not Minecraft's hostile mobs of zombies, creepers, and ender dragons, but instead state machinery, interpersonal glitches, and shape-shifting agent provocateurs. But what were these freedom dreams of obsidian, if not distorted memories of the nightmares of technological captivity? And with that, I'd like to jump into my presentation, which is really about the relationship between Pan-Africanism, questions of sustainable development, technology, and environmental justice. Minecraft in a Black world. What does such a title mean? As stated, this is the chapter in my book, Paulus Diaspora, Black Internationalism and Environmental Justice. And I must add, the book has also won uh, 2021 African-American Intellectual Heritage Society's Paul de Mori Book Prize, which I'm really excited about. Paulo Cameron Cafego is born in Bermuda in the 1930s. Uh, his father and mother were from Nevis and St. Kitts, respectively. He always had a sense of himself <clears throat> as a, a young Caribbean person with a view on the broader Black world. He knew his family had, had traced back to Liberia and always had interest in Africa and, and a very positive view of Africa. He was also born into a family of Garveyites in the island which made a tremendous impact on his political consciousness. His life is an epic you know, story of, of, of Pan-Africanism. He visits family members in Cuba where he's shot in the leg in the anti-Batista demonstration. This photograph is of a young Paolo as a student at Orangeburg's South Carolina State College where he gets involved in protest movements against white clan violence and also white citizen councils is subsequently uh, expelled from the college for his activism. While there he worked with activists such as Septima Clark, forward NAACP educator, whose name we don't call enough. After South Carolina, he travels to Pasadena, California, where he works on a graduate degree in ecological engineering. Uh, he leaves his studies and decides to return to Africa. This is the photograph of Paolo in approximately circa 1958 in Liberia, where as I mentioned, he knew his family came from. And it's in Liberia where he takes the name Paolo Cameron Cafego, having been born Roosevelt Brown in the island. His time in Liberia is transformative. He actually has to escape Liberia for being involved in a national strike. He also somehow finds time to become a leader in Bermuda's um, push for universal adult suffrage through an organization called the Committee of Universal Adult Suffrage. He flees Liberia, <clears throat> travels through Nkrumah's Ghana. He actually knew Nkrumah. He ends up in Kenya, uh, working with Joe Kenyatta's newly new administration, where he works in the areas of science and technology particularly uh, in education. This is his ID card from, from Tanzania, from Kenya rather. Here he cuts his teeth in what will mark his career uh, via the production of a number of sustainable development projects. This is his project, how to build a water tank with bamboo and cement. He actually publishes this in, public, in Papua New Guinea, but he starts to work on this kind of, um, these kind of sustainable projects. Uh, using natural, uh, using resources available to communities to build water tanks, to build homes. And th this, is, this is what he actually leaves behind. Uh, he becomes a global Black power activist, but he's not the kind of activist who leaves behind of, of, a broad cachet of, of political speeches. He leaves behind a, a, a massive inventory of, of manuals around self-determination. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those. 
In my book, Black Power in Bermuda, I discuss how Apollo meets Malcolm X in Kenya during Malcolm's second trip to Mecca. Malcolm returns to the United States and forms uh, the Black Power Organizing Committee, which included um, folks like Nathan Wright and Chuck Stone, about this brother doing work in Kenya. Uh, Paolo attends Philadelphia's Black Power Conference of 1968 due to the invitation of, of, of Wright and Stone. His acts to speak about the global relevance of Black power. And Paulo immediately says Black power is global. Um, it's relative beyond the borders of the United States. And we should host a conference in Bermuda, uh, which becomes the first international Black power conference in 1969. <clears throat> the keynote speaker of that conference is CLR James. And that conference also helps produce, becomes a funnel for. Bermuda's leading Black Power organization, which Paolo actually becomes an advisor for, the Black Beret Cadre. Uh, we don't have time to engage this photograph, but you're looking at several key leaders of not just Black Power in Bermuda, but also leaders of Bermuda's political um, development, uh, such as Jennifer Smith, who helps lead the Progressive Labor Party and political uh, leadership of the island in, in the 90s, and John Houghton Bassett, who actually was a friend of, of Fred Hampton, um, and Fred Hampton's uh, assassination really, really inspired him to push for Black power in Bermuda. As I mentioned, this is a photo of Celia James, who not only is the keynote speaker at, at, at the Black Power Conference, but a lifelong friend and, and advisor of Paulo. After the Black Power Conference, Paulo was invited to Australia. This photograph is courtesy of Australia's Security Intelligence Organization, which is tantamount to uh, the FBI, the United States FBI. ASIO is known for conducting surveillance on Black political groups. This is a photograph of Paulo in Melbourne's airport with two young Black power activists from Australia, Patricia Corwer and Bob Mazza, who Paulo would invite to Atlanta's Congress of African Peoples in 1970. This marks his beginning of his work as a conduit for what I will call and what others are calling a Black Pacific. In other words, the specific ways in which Black political movements in Oceania connected with the broader Black world. And I will we'll, we'll unpack this photograph later. But fast forward to Six Pack. On his way to Australia, uh, you know, one of the key ideas that had come out of the Black Power Conference was the need to have a Six Pan African Congress. The fifth had taken place in Manchester, England in 1945. Paolo had spoken with CLR James. CLR James said, well, if you want to have this next conference, uh, go talk to the old man. Uh, the old man at the time was Kwame Nkrumah, who was at that time living in Guinea Conakry. Paolo travels to Mika Nkrumah. Nkrumah says, yes, I, I have the endorsement of that conference as well as another Black Power conference that they attempted to hold in, in Barbados in 1970. He says, go talk to Julius Nairi. Nairi was president of uh, Tanzania, and this is pretty much why this conference takes place in Tanzania because of its connection to African liberation struggles um, and the political leadership of Judas Nairi, who was an astute Pan-Africanist. It takes place in 1974 over a span of eight days. Scholars have talked a lot about this conference. My work specifically looks at the impact of this conference, not just amongst folks in the Atlantic world, but also reorienting Six pack as an Indian Ocean conversation, Kenya's on the Indian Ocean, and also the involvement of Pacifica Islanders. In addition, while it only was eight days, the organizer for this conference took several years, and Paulo is, is very much a part of the early, early development of, of, the, of the conference. Six pack matters because, it, on one hand, it demonstrates Black internationalism's scope across the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Ocean worlds, but also it speaks to the global surveillance and gendered surveillance of black power and environmental justice activists. In other words, these relationships of, of, of black power and environmental justice are historic, as well as the surveillance of these activists. Uh, you know, the state does that, just simply doesn't place Black Panthers on the surveillance. We know the story of Cointel Pro, maybe not enough, but we should also be thinking about the global surveillance of black power via the British and French governments and also other Caribbean governments, Australian governments as well. These are a few photographs of some of the colleagues that Paulo worked with, including Cortland Cox, who becomes the general secretary of the conference. This was a crew that was based in, in DC. This is a, a snapshot of an FBI document 
the references one of the meetings that Cameron Carfago was involved in in DC. The FBI has over 1,500 pages of surveillance on Cameron Carfago. I've been able to retrieve probably hundreds of those, those documents via the State Department's archives and the Freedom of Information Act, which also reveals the layers of surveillance. This document created by a group named the Intelligence Evaluation Committee, which reported directly to the White House, spoke about the interrelationship of Black power across the Western Hemisphere, and, and Paolo's name is all across these documents. But let's fast forward. <clears throat> this is a photograph of a, a young Bobby Sykes, one of the leading Black power activists in Australia, who Australian media would refer to as Australia's um, Angela Davis. You could see why they would say that, although she doesn't resemble Angela Davis phenotypically, but politically, uh, she definitely saw Angela Davis as, as, a, as an ideological mentor. Bobby Sykes is involved in some of the organizing of Six Pack, uh, including a pre-Six Pack meeting in Jamaica in 1974, which she travels to. And interestingly, while she's in Jamaica, she meets with people like Amy Jacques Garvey, who ironically helped establish the Sydney branch of the UNIA, uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association in 1920. Uh, so this was an amazing moment of, of Pan-Africanism in Jamaica. Also present uh, were members of the Rasta community who grounded with, grounded with Bobby Sykes. Ironically, at the same time, Australia's national cricket team was having a match, test match game with Jamaica. And Bobby Sykes is asked by the Jamaican collective, Rasta collective rather, how can black people in Jamaica support their struggle? Uh, her response was, you should, you should demonstrate and protest you know, national events, for example, the sports events. Uh, they're, oppression, they're oppressing black people. Meanwhile, they're representing themselves as a white nation across the world. She wrote up a quick flyer, the Rasta Collective printed it off and they were giving out these flyers at that test match. This is a photograph of one of those flyers which comes from Jamaica's own special branch who the next day approached Bobby Sykes and pretty much demand that she does ensure these documents. This information, her involvement uh, is shared with an, an agent known as uh, Scorpion who in, informs the Australian, uh, the, the US embassy in Jamaica which passes on information about her activities the Australian Embassy in the United States. This, this speaks to the broader network of surveillance that I mentioned earlier. But these are the kind of fascinating narratives that take place before we even get to the eight days of Six Pack, which I would say one of Paulo's interventions was Six Pack or the, the call for Six Pack to address the needs of, of the technological needs of Africa. One of the plans was to develop a Pan African center of technology that could address the ecological and technological issues of Africa and the African diaspora. The plan was to generate a, a, a global body of Pan-African scientists who could serve as a crisis group to address these needs of crisis. Today, that would mean rising sea levels. Uh, back then, it, it was a reference to the spread of the desert. And you know, I think this is important because Six Pack is usually not remembered for its lens around science and technology. And this is the, one of the major interventions of the work. Uh, this was actual plan that Paulo put forth to build sustainable communities in Africa. Uh, there's a ton of these documents. I'm only going to show one uh, for the sake of time. Approximately 600 official delegates from across the Black world attend, including a delegation from the Melanesian island of Wanawatu, which is a fascinating country. At the time, Wanawatu was known as the Hebrides, and it was fighting a vicious battle against British and French colonialism at the same time. The political structure was known as the condominium. And so what developed with the New Hebrew National Party, who sent the delegation to Six Pack to seek support in the global fight, or seek support from the global Black world in the fight against colonialism. This is a young Barack Sope, who attends Six Pack with a, with a small group of other activists. His activities are quite documented <laughs> by the U.S. State Department. For example, this cable references his presence, the fact that he called on delegates to put pressure on UK and France for independence. He condemned colonialism and Africa and, and, and the world. And also really significantly pushed for a condemnation of the French nuclear test in Tahiti, which was a critical issue for 
the independence movements of Oceania, which I'll speak to shortly. Wanawatu's fight against colonialism was very racialized. You see signs, this is from a demonstration in 1978, Blacks must rule Wanawaku. The signs are written in the uh, Creole language known as Bislama. This photograph could be from a number of places in the Black world. And when I traveled to Wanawatu, I was, I was quite frankly blown by the sense of Pan-Africanism uh, that I felt uh, you know, across the, across the island. Paolo himself is invited to Wanawatu by the leader of the party, his name is Walter Linney and his sister Hilda Linney, who were leaders of the party and also Hilda Linney was leader of the women's wing. They strike up a really great political friendship and Wanawatu has such a critical space when we think about black political movements. Paulo, Paulo travels to the island, he visits with various communities, he makes speeches denouncing white supremacy, tells audiences that Jesus is black, Jesus came out of Africa. Uh, he also speaks about a phenomenon known as black birdie, which was a, a forced labor system that emerges in the, the 19th century, where Southern Confederates from the United States during the US Civil War and, and other, other, other planners forcibly take islanders, primarily from Wanawatu and what we would know as Melanesia, to work in sugar and cotton plantations in Australia, particularly in the area called Queensland, also in Fiji. Some islanders are also taken as far as the Pacific coast of the Americas, but that's a whole different discussion. But this also has relevance uh, in the moment of black power, in the moment of six pack, and also contemporary relevance because this creates a, a whole different diaspora of, of black communities in Australia known as the South Sea Islanders. Over 60,000 individuals are taken. I showed this photograph earlier. Uh, young Patricia Corver is actually a descendant of South Sea Islanders. After attending Atlanta's Congress of African People, she wants to go back to the islands. She wants to go home. For her home, uh, it's not Australia, it's the islands. It's just placed under intense surveillance, uh, ultimately placed on the stop list in Wanawatu. Uh, the French government and British government know she's connected with Paulu, that she was involved in what they believe to be Black Panther organizations. This also increases their anxiety around Paulu's own trip in Wanawatu. Uh, which he does travel to. He, he works with the Hebrides party. He's working in projects around appropriate technology. For example, his work includes how to sustainably take coconut oil from coconuts, sugar from sugarcane. He's working uh, production of shoes from leather and is really getting involved in the community. He's also expected to do political education. The French government and British government are quite concerned about his presence. They decide they need to extract Paulu from the island and they conduct a secret plan to bring in troops from maybe Fiji, from Hong Kong or Britain to extract Paulu and what they felt needed to be a, a quick and effective operation, particularly if villages responded. I've been to the community where he was taken from. It's probably the most peaceful place I've been to. They, and this is in the, two, in the 2000s, maybe had one rifle that they used for hunting. In other words, this was not an armed community. So the notion that the British government planned to fly in 200 something troops uh, to attack this community was, was, was quite striking. But even more phenomenal is that, and Paulo used to tell you know, young persons who had the opportunity to talk with him about being deported from Wanawatu. I was struck to, to actually see how this actually takes place. He's taken to the main airport where his waiting has been forced to wait for a flight to take him back to the United States. When leaders of the party spread the word, they drive their cars onto the tarmac, they park in front of the plane, clashes break out with the police, fines are given, folks are arrested, folks jump on top of the cars, shouting black power at the pilot. Uh, eventually, Paulo is deported and sent to California where he remarkably escapes from his FBI escort uh, in LA's airport. He was able to get a passport from other folks that's connected with, through an amazing collective of artists, uh, coordinated with folks like Jeff Donaldson out of Chicago. Uh, he's able to raise funds from folks like Elizabeth Catlett, phenomenal African-American sculptor who's actually in, in Mexico at the time. People like Gwendolyn Brooks, I mentioned CLR James. They put up funds to support Paulo's return back to Oceania. 
this document is a reference to uh, his publisher from, from one to one two. But when he returns, he cannot go back because it's still on the stop list in Wanawatu. So he, he stops in Fiji, where he builds relationships with an amazing core of Black women, Amelia Roku Pivuna, Vanessa Griffin, and Claire Slater, who had transformed the Fiji's Young Women's Christian Association into an amazing space of Pacific radicalism, political radicalism, and also they transformed Fiji into the, one of the major hubs of the nuclear free and independent Pacific movement, uh, which was denouncing colonialism, denouncing nuclear testing, but also made the argument that the reason why France, United States conducted nuclear testing in the region, for example, United States is triggering bombs uh, in the Marshall Islands, uh, hundreds of bombs after World War II. They argued that they can only do this kind of testing because they were colonized. And they were only colonized because they were black and brown. So the road to health, the road to freedom was also a political question, which meant that activists had to push for political independence. Wanawatu would take a leading role in what this means in Oceania, or rather I should say within Melanesia. Paolo builds these relationships with these activists. He cannot return to Wanawatu. Um, meanwhile, they, you know, these women had created an amazing network. Uh, they also organized the Pacific Women's Conference in Fiji in 1975. And due to these amazing connections, they create a context where Paolo was able to find work in Papua New Guinea, uh, working for its off the village development. But initially he travels and is just doing community work around sustainable development in some uh, really what we would think as remote, but as some other islands of, of, of Papua New Guinea. This is a document from ASIO, which notes his arrival in Papua New Guinea and his connection with the Pacific People's Action Front, which is, becomes the group that Vanessa Griffin and Claire actually run. They notice his arrival, is referred to as Oris, as he had taken the middle name of Cyrus. They arrived from Southern Islands. They knew he was from Bermuda, traces his travels, but they had no clear understanding of why he was in Papua New Guinea. He stays there for several years, and that's, that's you know, the date is September 1976. He eventually begins to work for the government. Uh, he produces the manual that I referenced earlier, how to be the water tank of bamboo and cement. But he also creates these projects uh, where he, he, he involves youth, uh, women, uh, folks pretty much left out of the, the economic um, uh, cycle of, the, of, of, of these kind of societies to work in technology, to take ownership of technology. So the, he established these projects all across the region. This is a manual house for every family, which is done through the Office of Village Development. As mentioned, he leaves a ton of these manuals. These are just literally a snippet. Some of his work is spread across Oceania. For example, Vanessa Griffin publishes a book, a self-help manual on technology for women in the Pacific. His blueprints uh, for technology inside this book. He works with a group called the South Pacific Appropriate Technology Foundation, which is developing a ton of projects around how to make oil drum stoves, repair sewing machines. I have involved with students at the University of Papua New Guinea which was an amazing space of Melanesian nationalism, the home of the New Guinea Black Power Group. Uh, the institution was referred to as a mile, mile factory by detractors because of its amazing political, uh, political space. Paulo would eventually return to Wanawatu once it achieves independence, circa 1980. He continues his work uh, until the mid 1980s. He then joins the UN Commission on Sustainable Development. Well, he had already joined the commission. And through the commission, he attends uh, Rio's Earth Summit in, in Brazil. He attends subsequent Earth Summits. He becomes heavily involved uh, working with groups such as the Alliance of Small Island States, which was an amazing group that connected small islands from the Caribbean, from Oceania, from Mediterranean who were addressing collective issues around rising sea levels. Now, this is in the 1970s, 1980s, when these conversations are taking place. Through the Commission of Sustainable Development, he represents the Pan-African Pan movement. And so throughout the 80s and the 90s, he's also this bridge for these questions of environmental justice that are also taken up 
by these groups across the global south in spaces like Durban's World Conference uh, Against Xenophobia in, in, in uh, South Africa in, in 2001. But as a central player in these movements, for me, this is important because while you know the quest for environmental justice is on one hand framed as something that is not a Black experience, number two, uh, if it is a framed as that, it's centered within uh, United States discussions. And number three, it's seen as something that's relatively recent. This work shows that there's a longer tradition of these engagements that include Black power, that include Pan-Africanism, and include a Black Pacific. Paulo's legacy still remains. This is me outside one of the homes he built uh, in the 80s, uh, not lived in, but still present. I was having a quite interesting trip, as you can imagine. Uh, the water tanks he built are still there in terms of that's construction. So his visibility, his work is still visible, just as visible as the tanks left by World War, left by United States government during World War II, and ships, uh, grenades, bottles, uh, you know, literally across the region. That are reminders of continued quest uh, for environmental justice, also as relevance on a ton of various areas. Uh, but that being said, I, I love to engage the audience and, and glaze, engage uh, Vashti in the discussion about the work. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for that. I feel like uh, there's a uh, there's a thing uh, that a scholar says, you know, when you're taking in a lot of information, it's like mm -hmm. a water hose in your face, you know, and the experience of every chapter in your book is that complete and that dense. Mm. So since you started um, with chapter eight and you named it Minecraft, right? And you just took us through um, this complex collage of artifacts. I want to ask you just to sort of uh, frame your thinking about this chapter for the audience, because I know that you kind of did a little research, so I know you think in a couple of different languages, um, like Paula, interestingly enough. So why, in terms of your framing, is this chapter Minecraft? And then let me just step back for a moment and ask you, to share with all of us. Have you ever played the game? Yes, and that's that's actually part of, that's okay. actually part of the discussion. Um, you know, I, I, I've said a number of times that, you know, my first book, Black Power in Bermuda, I wrote a book, uh, but in Paolo's diaspora, I think I was, I was starting to become a writer uh, in that I was finding my own voice. Part of my craft is what, this notion I call my Anansi rhythm. And my, my Anansi rhythm is, is, is you know, Anansi think is proverbial, tricks the deity, spider, mm -hmm. sometimes man, sometimes woman, out of, out of West Africa, out of Ghana, Anansi the trickster, Anansi also a, a, a divine artist. My Anansi rhythm is, is when I put different layers of meanings uh, in, into my work. Um, and so there's different, just like the Anansi stories where there's messages for different levels of the community, um, that's also throughout the, throughout the book. And, and sometimes it's more pronounced than others. So I'm also, what I was trying to do in each chapter was also mark my own physical moment of where I was when I wrote that particular part of the book. Uh, so it's a marker, not just for the historical moment, but also a moment of where I was at. Uh, I also come from a background of co computer science. Uh, my first degree was in computer science from Florida a and University, shout out to FAMU, Ratless. But also, um, you know, it's, it's also reflected that I was in playing Minecraft with my daughters. Um, you know, Ifa Shadu and, and, and Aya Swan. And, you know, Paolo was an engineer. Um, so he worked with the earth. Questions of, of, of mining also speak to the notion of, I mean, forge a diaspora. It's something intentional. Um, so the minecrafting is the creating a diaspora world. They're not just simply taking it for granted. For example, we could start the we could start in the conversation by saying there are black persons in the Pacific. And now we say, okay, black folks are everywhere. Right. But this chapter shows that these black communities 
once they identify themselves, they work together to build a better black world. So with all that in mind, I asked my daughters to really, you know, give me all the vocabularies of mine. And they will tell you I'm horrible at Minecraft. I, I taught them how to play, but I didn't go much further than that. Now they're amazing virtuosos and I'm not, I'm not invited anymore. But I asked them to give me the vocabularies of Minecraft, the concepts, the names, the, the villains, the themes. And so within that, that first section, I use all the themes from Minecraft that you wouldn't know if you don't know Minecraft, but Obsidian, yes, Obsidian is, is Black people, but Obsidian is also a, 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 a or that you mine in Minecraft as well. So that's that's the that's the creative aspect of, of trying to tell this political story, but also speaking to the moment in a way that's creative and also is a marker for my own engagement with, with, with my family, my kids. Thinking about where we are right now, where we are right now, as we talk about science and technology, right? So the science and technology of this vaccine moment that we're in, uh, the surveillance that we are under, mm -hmm. um, all of the technological uh, pressure and possible liberation for black people in this moment that we're in, everything that you have packed into chapter eight in terms of how you have been sort of connecting the world that Paula traveled, which is extraordinary because my next question is going to be, how did he do it? Mm. Did he have a twin? Uh, <laughs> because the technology theoretically should not have been able to support him being in all of these places in the way that he was all in all of these places at the particular time that he was there but somehow he managed to do it. So I wanna hold that because I actually mm -hmm. think it's important for you to speak to that. But in terms of how you've mapped this chapter, how do you see this chapter as you think about the moment that we're in right now with all this going on in this present moment for black people of the diaspora? While I am, I am an historian, um, for me, it's always been important, been important to try to have my work address the contemporary issues of, of the Black world. I, th I think that's the mission of scholar activists. I think that's the mission of folks like W.B. Du Bois. Um, I think that's been the mission of, of, of Walter Rodney. Uh, that's been the mission of folks from Bermuda, um, like Nellie Musson, uh, one of our major historians of the island. You know, what's the relative nature um, of our work to the contemporary struggles of, of the Black world? One of Paulo's main, you know, main calls was that you have to politicize and address, you know, the scientists and the engineers in our political work, uh, because if they're not politicized or not, you know, not socialized to have a political consciousness, then they just create weapons for the system. Whether we call that system Babylon, whether we call that system capitalism, uh, it, you know, has the same results for Black people. Um, you know, when I was in Wanawatu, I had a ton of conversations. And, and Fiji as well, with students, activists, organizers, villagers who reference the sea levels rising, uh, who reference you know there's less land than there were when they were when they were younger. And for me to see these you know this these issues being part of a longer conversation, there's a there's a there's a crisis on our hands. The last chapter talks about um, you know Pan Africanism and, and as an agenda, you know a contemporary agenda. Or environmental justice as a contemporary agenda for Pan Africanism. There's an eighth Pan African Congress, that, or seventh, seventh rather, uh, in, in the 1980s that talks about these contemporary issues. Um, you know, as director of the William Mamatra Institute at UMass Boston, you know, I was witness firsthand, as we all have, right, the, the impact of, of, of COVID 19 on Black communities. Uh, part of my work was, you know, trying to highlight uh, those experiences, looking at, you know, public data released by Boston's health community, but also addressing some real issues where we've been left out, um, you know, immediately. And we're, we're still gonna see the results of, of, you know, black communities who were marginalized in areas of technology, i.e. Wi-Fi access. Uh, some of my own students relied on the campus for Wi-Fi access. Um, once the campus was shut down, there's a direct impact in the ability to do their schoolwork. Um, meanwhile, their friends and family and communities being first line, you know, workers had to still, you know, go out um, into the society. Um, you know, at, at one point there was a notion, there were these misconceptions that Black people could not 
get COVID-19, you have to push back against that kind of work. But also I don't think we've appreciated, for example, Africa's responses to COVID-19 from an ecological, from a, what I would say a scientific and socio-ecological perspective, where you know, these heads of states and, and leaders of, of, of health institutions, uh, including you know, leading African women, met uh, in, in early February 2020 to talk about continental responses to COVID-19 based upon their experiences with issues like Ebola. Um, and I, I don't think we've talked enough about the, the innovation of Africa uh, and, and the Black world in addressing the response to, to COVID-19. I think that, I think that dimin diminishes uh, the intellectual, uh, you know, uh, savviness and, and understanding and engagements with, 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 the, with the world and e e world eco ecologically um, that also come up in this chapter. One question here, how can someone access Paula's technical manuals and other writings? Is there an anthology? None at all, and, and, but it, it's, it's a great question. And you know, part of the work, um, you know, what, what, what drives my work, right, is, is, is the communities I come from. What drives my work, and the soundscape of this book was, um, you know, reggae dance, old song class culture of the 1990s, 2000s um and write this book i probably listened to probably every world song clash of the early 2000s uh it, it kept my sanity uh it gave me energy and, and and that that's the soundtrack so one of the one of the mentors um comes for me comes from a former selector of, of a sound system named bass odyssey out of jamaica a selector named scringy who was clashing Selected their filings from from Bodyguard, um, a Cave Valley in Jamaica in the early two thousands, and and Scringy, you know, <laughs> tells filings that you think you're a big song, but I'm not here to build sound. I'm here to build a studio. Like you could you could have the sound. I want the studio, and for me, that metaphor is, is how I approach the book as opposed to the project. The book is one thing, uh, but the project produces the book. The project itself produces more than the book. Uh, so the project. Uh, you know, was, was around Paulo was 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 building a, a global global building a virtual digital archive of Paulo's um, manuals, his speeches, his work, surveillance, interviews, photographs from across the world, and from that Paulo project, we could produce a book, we could produce anthologies, we could produce documentary film. So, the, so the project is to try to you know help create exactly what the uh, what the audience members are asking for. Now, I would say that um, I was able to, you know, digitize or at least make, make digital copies of a number of Paulo's manuals. Um, he would say he produced over 11. Um, I don't have 11, okay. but he also worked in more than 11 projects. Uh, so I do have an amazing, I, I do have a critical catalog of those of those manuals and I would love to talk through uh, those manuals with folks who have a you know a formal quote unquote you know scientific background um, to unpack some of what that means beyond you know my for the most part political lens. Uh, that's actually the, the kind of work that I'm that I'm, I'm interested in um, in doing because I think it's significant you know for for the for the current world that we're in, particularly trying to find sustainable solutions to um, to our world. And for example, one of the things Paulo did, uh, he took, you know, a really known Bermuda way of building roofs, where roofs in Bermuda are built with limestone, uh, which are used to purify rainwater. And the rainwater runs into tanks. And that's for, for the most part how we collect the water in the island um, for, you know, for centuries. It's, it's one of the sustainable uh, and ecological practices that Bermuda has owned. Although, uh, you know, a lot of things that Black Bermudians do, we wouldn't have identified ourselves as being ecological activists, yeah, uh, just part of the cultural backdrop, which is which is a problem when we think of scholarship, right? Sometimes scholarship, you know, creates these labels that miss the actual traditions. Um, so he would take those models with him in Oceania. So some of his innovations, he actually takes these innovations from Bermuda and applies them in other contexts learns other other techniques and brings them back to other spaces and that was kind of his, his his first approach that you shouldn't you know we can't really actually own these ideas uh they, they must be sure and that that was actually a tough lesson for me when you think about someone when we traveled across the world in archives you think look at the research i did 
you know, you can look at what I did, the work I did. Um, but actually, Paulo's voice has, has actually encouraged me to actually share, you know, be really open with sharing the work. And in that notion, to address the first question, uh, I haven't mentioned the book one, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship Award, which is financing uh, the book to be digitized uh, through the NEH, and it will be available online uh, so that the communities who work with Paolo, because this book is not just about him, it's about the communities he work with uh, across the world can access this book uh, free of charge. And I'm, I'm really excited about that because access, access does really does really matter. No, I think you've done a really good job of really holding um, Paolo's intention of like community genius and innovation. Um, and also, and then his, the way that you move back and forth between his science, but his recognition of what um, the communities that he's engaging with, what mm. they already know, what they already have, what right. they've already solved. Right. Um, how did you find or become interested in his work? I returned to Bermuda after undergrad, once again, a FAMU, can't say FAMU enough. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm reading books like, rereading, you know, Chand on a Rock, which is a classic <laughs> book of slavery in Bermuda. Um, mentioned Nelly Moss's Mind the Onion Seed. I'm also reading, you know, Rasta Resistance. And I'm quite upset with Bermuda as a colony. I, I, I don't have a plan, you know, there's a collective of us that have these issues and uh, but I meet Paulu. I'm invited to a meeting with Paulu by a former activist of the Black Bird Kajri. Her name was Michelle Caldoun. Um, if you look around the room, you see that Caldoun name is, is with us today. Uh, she invites me and a number of other, you know, younger persons to meet Paulu, and it just changes my world. Um, you know, I was one, as I mentioned, I ran away from, I started as an engineer, I ran away from science, from, from chemistry. Uh, Paolo was someone who immediately, you know, recalibrated my thinking around the, the political significance of science. Um, he knew the folks I read about. You know, I read about Rodney, he knew Rodney. I read about James, he knew James. I remember one ridiculous conversation where I was trying to teach him <laughs> about Yosef Benyakinen's uh, perspective on how African people built the pyramids, not knowing that Paolo and, and Yosef Benyakinen had an over 30 year friendship. Uh, that Paolo knew Benyakinen before he even wrote these books. And, and one of the things that actually comes up in this book is, uh, you know, Benyakinen actually travels to Papua New Guinea to meet with Paolo. And he writes one of his books um, about the global connection to the Black world at Paolo's kitchen table. That book also became an archive for me. Um, so I meet Paolo, um, you know, we have a ton of direct conversations. He would introduce me to activists such as uh, Sylvia Hill, who's based in DC when I'm at Howard. In graduate school, he visits Howard and is consistently, you know, encouraging us to push it to the limit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I interview Paulo, but at several conversations, he teaches me so much about the, the black world. And his, as you see in the chat, he's a national hero of the island. So I'm not the only one who's actually having these conversations or engagements with. Uh, so the work, you know, the, the work flows from actually knowing Paolo on a, on a real personal basis and, and knowing what he meant to the world. In what world do Paolo and Jack Tucker share the same space in Bermuda as national heroes, especially when the latter was an unrepentant white supremacist who fought against Black political, economic, cultural, intellectual uplift at every turn? It's the world in which we know, or which some would recall Babylon. Um, you know, Babylon coming from, you know, the biblical uh, reference to Babylonia, you know, a place of confusion, uh, a place of, of, of violence, a place of misunderstanding. I think this is one of, you know, Rasta's major gifts to the, the freedom struggles of the Black world is the notion of Babylon. Um, and for me, you know, like I said, we could talk about, you know, the system, we could talk about the liberal state, but for me, it's also a question of, Babylon, where there could be confusion, right? That's the, it allows that to happen. Uh, where on one hand, our Bermuda's government at the time was trying to do a really important work of establishing national heroes, which colonies usually don't have. That process usually comes, uh, you know, it's legitimized. National heroes are usually legitimized after independence is won. 
uh, but Bermuda remains a British colony, Bermuda's PLP government was trying to, in, 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 you know, imbue a, a sense of, of, of nationalism uh, into the island to study Bermuda's national heroes, to study um, Bermuda's own culture, to push folks along the, the path to independence from my perspective. But also the, the reference to Jack Talker is also, I would, I, I, it appears to be an ode to Bermuda's large white minority population as well. Um, Jack Talker was their hero. Uh, he fought for segregation. He fought for white minority rule. Um, his one of the folks who Paolo was literally about to fight on the floor of parliament because they denounced the Black Power movement. Um, you know, Henry Tucker, unfortunately, this is, this is the way history sometimes writes things, uh, gets remembered for being one of the leaders of the UBP party, not a Bermuda party, um, at a moment where the system is forced to make concessions um, in terms of segregation, um, voting rights because of Bermuda's rise in black militancy. But in, in, in many ways, his, his enemy of, 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 of the black world and very unabashedly, um, this, is, this is not her say, you know, look at, and I've looked extensively at British foreign Commonwealth office documents. Uh, he very much aligned himself uh, with white elites across the world and was very much antagonistic to, to black political struggle in the island. Was Paula's view of a continental Africa sustainable development ever fleshed out as a six pan African Congress? The question of sustainable development continental wise is put on the table. Yes, that's one of the one of the key goals or aims of six pack was that like that's there are maybe five aims. That's a one stated aim um, is, is to build this pan African entity around science and technology. But at the end of the conference, it, it's not ratified as a next step. And you know, this, this was interesting because this is national politics also came to play because let's ask the technical questions. Okay, we're gonna build this, this, this center of technology. Where is it gonna be? Like what's the country best suited to be the hub? And some of those questions are not, are not flushed out. Um, Six pack actually goes from being a very much grassroots led initiative um, to be in a project that's, that's driven by a uh, few state leaders. And there are a number of voices who are actually silenced at Six Pack. Uh, that being said, the, the questions of sustainable development don't stop at the conference. Um, Paulo continues to be involved in regional groups across East Africa around sustainable development. Um, and he does this in, into the 70s. So the work around Pan-Africanism and sustainable development that continues beyond the conference at the state level. Uh, it's also at the UN level that the Paulo is involved in. I mentioned the, the Commission on Sustainable Development. So those questions do continue, but just not under the banner of six pan after six pack. I don't think scholars have truly engaged um, this world of Africa, uh, which is also the world of engineers African engineers from the diaspora who return to Africa, who get involved in, in sustainable development. Usually we think about political leaders who return to Africa. For example, Black Panther Party leaders like the O'Neills return to Tanzania, uh, the Black Panther Party of Algeria. All those things are really important, but there are other kind of uh, Pan-Africanist thinkers uh, who also have a lens around technology like Paolo, who, who we should also be talking about. How can we, Bermudian organizations in particular, monetarily and otherwise, support this project? I'd love to have uh, those, those conversations uh, offline. Um, I think it's important. Um, I, think, I think we're actually seeing some support uh, for Khan Khaldun and Criterion Connection, one of the sponsors for this talk tonight. Uh, I think Fresh TV is doing a really amazing and important job of streaming this event. Um, shout out to Elmore, who's been a, a strong support and I uh, look forward to being on, on, on the show. I've uh, done talks in Bermuda, Bermuda's National Library has been an ally. Uh, there's more that can be done, I think at a systemic level. But if we're talking specifically financially, uh, there have been times where I, I will be frank, um, I wasn't you know, able to secure funds uh, via Bermuda directly for the research, but there were other times where I was direct supported. Um, former Premier Ewell Brown 
who has been a staunch advocate of, of, of supporting uh, Black history, actually, you know, provide the seed money for the Paulu project, um, you know, before I had any other support, institutional or otherwise. And so some of the work that you see, the, some of the photographs, uh, some of the, the digitized documents, uh, some of the travel, that's supported by uh, Ewa Brown's uh, generous donation that I, I mentioned in the book. So in that tradition, um, you know, there were still kind of specific ways that, that you know, that this kind of work could be supported. Now, I love to have those conversations uh, offline. Many folks of his time, he returns over and over again to really lift up the work of Black women around and across the diaspora in terms of what their work and their commitment was. Can you talk about that a little bit? What's important is I mentioned Fiji and I mentioned a collective um, out of Fiji, Vanessa Griffin, Claire Slater, Amelia Rook Devuna, who are drivers of the Nuclear Free Pacific Conference, who are a strong example of Black women's internationalism. Uh, they also are critical in my forthcoming book, Pacifica Black, which is focused on uh, Black internationalism and Oceania uh, looks more in detail with political movements in Papua New Guinea, uh, West Papua, New Caledonia, mm -hmm. it's still a French colony, Wanawatu, Australia as well. Uh, but, 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 the, but in that story, you know, some of the networks that Paulu created uh, with Black women in Oceania, I explore, I explore their work more broader. For example, there's a phenomenal activist name of Kath Walker, who is one of Australia's leading uh, poets. Her son, Dennis Walker, actually founds the Black Panther Party of Australia. Uh, she travels across the world and in the United States, advocating for Black internationalism. Uh, she's one of the first Pacific, you know, activists who I actually see use the frame a Black Pacific to describe the work in the 1970s. Uh, black women like Hilda Linney, who, as I mentioned, is from Wanawatu. Uh, when I went to Wanawatu, I, I interviewed Hilda Linney and I asked her, you know, really frankly about Paolo. And for her, she's her response to Paolo was everything. Um, she's someone who, you know, not only took Paolo across the island, um, she was like his, his younger sister, uh, but she also, you know, mapped out my own trail in following that work. Um, you know, she was a major leader um, in Wanawatu when she created these amazing networks of oceanic leaders across Oceania. Uh, Patricia Corwer, who I mentioned, activist from Australia, then was back blackbirded, deported from Wanawatu. Those networks still remain. And so part of this process of this work was working with those networks of Black women, uh, elder activists uh, that, that haven't given up the fight. Um, when, I was in one, when I was in Australia, for example, uh, you know, they led me to places like the Australian uh, tent embassy in Sydney, which comes out of a, a 1970s tent embassy, which, you know, they were having extremely important conversations around Black Lives Matter. This was the moment of Ferguson. They were quite tuned in to the uprisings in the aftermath of, of, of Mike Brown's death. They also were leading, you know, massive demonstrations against uh, a phenomenon known as Black deaths while in police custody, which is quite frankly one of the leading cause of the death of, for Black and Indigenous persons in Australia. Uh, so when we fast forward to, you know, the images from last year uh, of, 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 of Black people in Australia protesting and supporting Black Lives Matter, this didn't fall from the sky. Um, this is work that you know Aboriginal organizers, including Black women like Patricia Colbert, have been advocating since the 1970s. And Paolo's work for me helped take us back or remind us a reminder of those some of those longstanding networks. Yeah, I really appreciated the fact that there was so much of that there because you, that it's a it's a it's like there's there's work that. Um, Black women around the diaspora are able to do um, that actually nobody else can do. There's, a way, there's a way that that the women can move. We know some of the work, some of the some of the stuff that came up when Paola was traveling. But as you were tracing his steps, <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn in that way? 
it starts before um, Paulo's diaspora. You know, for, for, for me, it's, it starts, um, it starts when I'm working on my dissertation, which is on, which was on Black Paul and Bermuda, which becomes the first book. And I find myself in, in, in London and, you know, I'm in London's National Archives. And it just feels like all eyes on me. Like I feel like Tupac wrote that song for me, <laughs> all eyes on me. Uh, but it wasn't just me. There happened to be a, a small contingent of, of, you know, young PhD students. We happened to be in National Archives at the same time. Some from Howard, some from other places, and we all felt the same thing. All eyes were on us. Uh, and that was ironic because I was looking at surveillance documents of, of Black Power in Bermuda and, you know, the state's construction of a whole apparatus of, of propaganda um, targeted at, at not Black Bermudians. But also, you know, quite frankly, I looked at files from the surveillance of Jamaica, right? The surveillance of Black Power in countries that were no longer Black, that were no longer British colonies. That was striking to me. Like these aren't no longer British colonies. So, you know, why are there seven files on Black Power in Guyana? It's, I mean, it's not a British colony in the British FCO files. Uh, Barbados, um, islands like St. Lucia, you know, St. Kitts, Antigua. I don't return to those files of surveillance until this book, right? Almost, you know, 10 years later. But the research for that was from 2006. Along the road to that research was being pulled out of, out of a line um, in London's airport as I bought the board. You know, part of that process is being told I could use photographs of Black Palm Bermuda uh, that were, you know, owned by the police department or registered the police department. And then communication goes dead when it comes time for publication. Um, you know, a, 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 along the road, right? There's just this, there's just this long, process at some point you just jump in it at, at some point as as a scholar you say well this this is yeah this, this is just it you know the, the double look at the passport um the passport taken to the word machine that the other folks passwords aren't taken to um that just becomes part of that just becomes part of the road and i'm i'm, I'm being you know semi metaphoric um but you know i, I made that decision um some time ago that uh if we're being honest about the surveillance of black power activists we can't expect to not you know walk some of those roads when we're studying black power um you know at, at, at the same time seeing the, the trauma that the black power movement activists went through you know the surveillance i've experienced doesn't feel like anything compared to what those activists went through at all. So it also, it actually kind of feels a um, little, you know, <laughs> ridiculous for me sometimes to make the comparison, but I know what it feels like. I understand what you're saying, but it's important to say it. Right? Indeed. Because, Indeed. It, uh, because it calls our attention to how, how deep the surveillance really goes and what the concerns really are, right. and how dangerous and powerful the work really is. And part of my work, quite frankly, was just to show the layers of it. Yeah. Bermuda's Black Power Conference. Um, the British government, in cahoots with Henry Tuck and the EBP government, and the US government, actually collaborate uh, to create a plan where a, a, they would act like a, a British Navy ship malfunctioned off the coast of Bermuda to bring troops to the island in preparation for this conference. This is not. <laughs> Cointelpro. This is the, the British government. This is the plan endorsed by the Prime Minister. This is the Henry Tucker. This is this is the you know US State Department. Uh that's what we're talking about. You know, we're not just talking about you know these other, we're talking about entities and broad collaborative networks that are what I would define as being a matrix of white imperialism and white internationalism. Um, quite frankly, you know, we're often told. Well, often sometimes questions are raised of, you know, why should black people unify? But the, the, we never raised the same questions about how the white world has intentionally created itself exactly. as a white world. Thank you so much. I have like pages of questions that I'm not gonna get to in this, but I got your email. 
Indeed. Uh, so Ivan, hi, how are you? You get the last word. Thank you so much. I want to thank you both um, for, for really making this, this Earth Day um, and our focus on Earth Day um, and, and what these days mean to us um, be a special one. Um, so I want to thank you. I want to thank Criterion Connection, Bank of America, and, and our staff um, who, you know, set it up and break it down, um, the folks in the background. So a couple of quick things. Uh, Keto, Pacifica Black, Black internationalism in Oceania. Is that already out or is it is it coming out next? That will be in the fall. And also Paulo Das will be out in paperback in the fall as well. Excellent, excellent. So uh, thank you for that, everybody. Uh, keep it on your radar. And uh, Vashti, thank you once, thank you twice, and thank you three times. Um, I, look, I, I know that um, it was a physical journey for you to get up and get ready for this, and, and nobody would know it. Um, <laughs> folks would not know that, that um, you all don't know each other already. Um, it's such a natural uh, conversation. Um, and I thank you for mediating that experience. And, and yes, my children have even uh, witnessed um, a little bit as well. Trust me, this is a community. Um, and, and that message was driven home uh, by both of our guests um, and by the gentleman scholar activist of whom we spoke today and, and who we learned about today. Um, so on behalf of the African American Museum in Philadelphia, um, I do wanna thank you both again uh, for joining us, encourage folks to support our museum support any cultural institution um, um, that's within reach uh, virtually or physically and travel down those roads of uh, curiosity and inquiry um, so that we can continue to discover uh, these roads of, of scholarship, um, black intellectual thought and cultural production that ultimately uh, will lead us into and out of the 21st century um, in a much better place. Um, so I, 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 I wanna say much more, but, but I'll sum it up to say I'm grateful for our audience, thank you for your participation. Stay engaged with the museum. Please support us and please stay tuned. Stay on the line for just a couple seconds for a few closing messages. Um, I want to clap my hands, but I'm sending some uh, fire emojis over text. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You are on this path. You're on this path like a sun on an arc that moves closer and closer to a horizon. Yours is a horizon of an unknown thing. And it's a great thing. And it's a vast thing. And if you're breathing, you were chosen to take on this task. And it's true that your chest holds the size of a sky. And what about the matter of the master of that sky? It is the heart. The heart is an eye. And you could choose to deny that eye the right to see. And you could choose to allow that eye the right to be as bright as a thousand suns in the sky of your chest. You are a sun on an arc that moves closer and closer to a horizon of an unknown thing. It's a vast thing. And if you're breathing, you were chosen.